In this sermon, The New Covenant, Reflections on Faith and Commitment Pastor Timothy R. Carter delves into the importance of genuine commitment and acceptance of Jesus, highlighting the concept of heaven and a new earth devoid of sin. Pastor Carter discourages superficial Christian-like behavior and stresses the importance of individual commitment to Jews. That's what we're looking forward to. That's right. Time with Him. Amen. One day. Well, we think about heaven as it being far off, but actually heaven is coming here. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to this earth, because there will be a new earth, where the old earth will pass away. So this earth is going to be reset. It's going to pass away. There's going to be a new creation, a new earth made where there isn't any sin, any corruption, any effects of sin. And there we will get to worship God forever. Yes. There we'll get to be with Him forever. Amen. That is if we have truly made a real commitment and acceptance of Jesus. Unfortunately, there are some people who don't make real commitments to Jesus. They show up to church. They claim the name of Jesus. They do Christian-like things. But they don't always make a real commitment to Jesus. And we can't always know who those people are. Sometimes people among the Christians aren't truly Christians. Jesus said that there will be tares among the wheat, yep. which means they will, be, they will look like wheat. A tear is a weed, and that weed will look like the wheat. And you don't need to worry about the tares. When the weeds are growing up among the wheat, wait and let the harvesters sort it out. In other words, he is telling his disciples, don't try to pick out who's sincere about God and who's not. Just worship me the way you're supposed to worship me. And when I come back, I will do the sorting. I know who belongs to me. I know who truly is committed to me. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> so we need to worship God regardless of what other people are doing. That's right. Sometimes people tell me, I don't want to go to church. No, this is nothing against anybody in this room specifically or anybody in this congregation. But this is a common phrase that people like to say. Well, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go up there where all those people are hypocrites. Uh -huh. I don't want to go up there. There are hypocrites in that church. There are hypocrites that go to Wednesday night. There are hypocrites that go on Sunday. There are hypocrites that go to the yard sale and so forth. We don't need to worry about if that person is a hypocrite. That's right. We ought to be concerned about our relationship with Jesus. If there are hypocrites in the congregation, mm -hmm. they still have the opportunity to repent. They still have the opportunity to come to Jesus. So if your excuse is you don't want to be in church with hypocrites, mm -hmm. that's not a good excuse. Jesus promised that we will have hypocrites live among us. We ought to worship him regardless of what other people do. We ought to worship him. Our relationship with him is rooted in him, not in others. Amen. So stop using the excuse that other people aren't right. Make the commitment for yourself that you will commit to him and always be committed to him. Locate, please, Matthew chapter 26. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you because we get to look into your word. Thank you because you have set us apart. You have redeemed us. And you have given us this day so that we can worship you. Help us that our hearts will be receptive to you. Let us be changed by your word. Help us to reflect you when we go home today. When we leave this place, that we will carry your word with us more clearly understood than when, before we came. Help us to have a relationship with you that's more solid than ever before. Help us, Lord, that we can have that true intimacy that can only come by your spirit. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Jesus 
was preaching a sermon. When he completed his sermon, Matthew tells, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So Jesus preached the sermon. As soon as he finished preaching, he turns to his disciples and says, Every year we celebrate Passover. So it's like saying to us, Every year we have a big Easter celebration. Mm -hmm. Every year we have a big Thanksgiving dinner. Every year we have a big Christmas banquet. So it's something that everybody's expecting, that everybody participates in. So as soon as he finishes his sermon, he turns to his disciples and says, Hey, we're about to have a major celebration in remembrance of what God did when he brought us out of Egypt. God promised that he would deliver us from the death angel. He would deliver us from the bondage of Pharaoh, and he did. By the blood of the Lamb spread on the door facing, we got to leave. The death angel passed over, which is where the word comes from. The death angel passed over and didn't kill the firstborn son inside the house where the blood was shed. So Jesus is saying, we're about to celebrate that. In a few days, we're going to celebrate Passover. But I'm going to die. Wow. Talking about putting a damper on something. They're with him for over three years. His disciples are with him every day. <clears throat> they left what they knew and followed him. You remember how he chose his disciples? He would walk up to people while they were at their job, remember Levi, who was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Jesus went up to him while he was collecting taxes and said, follow me. So Matthew was at work and Jesus showed up at his job and said, follow me. Remember Peter, his brother told him about Jesus. And so some of these came to Jesus because they heard about him through someone else. But others... Jesus picked them out specifically and said, I want you to follow me. How have you started following Jesus? Did someone else tell you about him? Did someone else witness to you? Have you been witnessing like Andrew did to Peter? We ought to be that kind of witness to go out and tell people about Jesus. Bringing people into God's house to worship with us. Worshiping him. Jesus said, we're all going to have this big celebration, this Passover event, but I'm going to die. I'm going to be delivered up. The fact that he says crucified is telling these Jews that the Roman government is going to kill me. The crucifixion was done by the Romans. It was illegal for the Jews to do a crucifixion, but it was the way the Romans killed their enemies. The Romans, so he says crucify, he's letting, letting them know that it's the Romans who will push this forward. It's the Romans who will follow this out. It's, I will die by the hand of the Romans. So why didn't he run? He knows they're coming for him. Think about it. If, if you knew that the secret service men were coming after you, the guys in the black suits that surround the president, if you knew they were coming after you, would you... Keep yourself in the public, or would you run and hide? They were, they, he knew that they were coming for him. He knew that the government officials were coming to arrest him with the intent of crucifying him. Not just to arrest him and put him on trial to see if he was innocent. He was already found guilty before he was arrested. And he knew the outcome before they came to arrest him. But he doesn't run and hide because he knows the will of the Father. Jesus knew the will of the Father when he chose his disciples. Which disciple is always mentioned first? Peter. Which disciple is always mentioned last? Who is the least of the disciples? Judas. He's always mentioned last because he is the one that's not really a disciple. He is a disciple, but he's not truly committed to Jesus. Judas is the one who betrayed Jesus. Judas was a thief. We read all the Gospels together. Judas 
was the, tre the church treasurer. Judas was the guy that looked after the finances of Jesus' ministry. And Judas was a kleptomaniac in John. John describes Judas as a kleptomaniac. In the English version, we see it as the word thief. But in the Greek, it's the word klepto, which is the word where we get kleptomaniac. And he's describing that Judas, by strategic planning, would skim money off of the pocketbook. It wasn't just he saw the money laying there and spur of the moment he grabbed it and stuck it in his pocket. But this is a long, drawn-out plan that he had a strategic master plan where he was secretly taking money and none of the other disciples were aware of it. How do we know that, he, that they weren't aware of it? Because in the story this morning, when Jesus says what he says, and we'll get there, the other disciples don't realize it. Here, in the opening of this chapter, we see that the chief priests, who are the chief priests? The chief priests are the ones in charge of the church. So they're like the boss men of the, the church. The boss men of the church are seeking to kill Jesus. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders assemble at a place the high priest's house. So they go to the church parsonage. They're at the high priest's house, so they go to the church parsonage. And there at the church parsonage, they plan, I'm tired of this Jesus guy. Let's kill him. But then they decide, yes, we're definitely going to kill him, but not during the festival. Because he's so popular, if we kill him during the festival, then we'll have a big problem. Just imagine if today we were going to have a big Thanksgiving celebration or a big Christmas parade where the whole town is invited. You wouldn't want to do your dirty work and kill a guy at the event, at the big parade, right? That's basically what they're saying. We don't want to kill him at the big event where everybody's in town because that could cause trouble. Everybody then will know we're the bad guy. Everybody will know we're the murderers. So they are planning to kill him, but they want to do it in secret. Jesus already knows what they're planning. He told his disciples, they're coming for me. Even though they met in secret, Jesus has already told his disciples they're coming for him. This shows us that Jesus knows what's happening. He knows the intent of your heart. He knows the intent of of your neighbor's heart. He knows what's happening in your life. Nothing is taking him by surprise, so he knows everything. He knew their heart, and he knows our heart. He knows if we're truly committed to him. Are you truly committed to him? Or do you want to just fellowship with him to get what you want? Have you ever been around somebody that you felt like you just uh, uh, suspicious that she's not really my friend? She's just wants to copy my homework. Mm. Or that person at work that don't, you feel like the only reason they're nice to you is because they they know that if they, you do your good job and they can gleam off of your work, you make their job easier. Or you feel like that guy's not really my friend, but he just wants to watch closely what I do so he can invest in the same things I invest in. That kind of person that you feel like they're trying to take advantage of you, that's what Judas is. Judas is not really Jesus' friend. He is hanging around Jesus to get what he can get. He's not there to really provide ministry to Jesus. He's there looking for himself a step up. Which, by the way, did you know Judas' name means praise? So when other people would refer to him, they would call him, oh, that's one of Jesus' friends. That's praise. Judas means praise. So the way the Jews would have thought of Judas is his name is praise. So it's like today if somebody's name is joy or somebody's name is gladness, that's what they're calling him. They're calling him praise. They look at him as somebody that ought to bring forth hope, somebody that ought to bring forth a celebration because he a man of praise. But he doesn't live up to his name. They go to a house in Bethany. Bethany is a place where the sick people live. 
They didn't have a, a specific building where they kept their sick people. They had a colony, which is Bethany, where the sick people, the poor people would live. It's like uh, what we would consider the other side of the tracks. You know that phrase, the other side of the tracks? Or the projects. Bethany was the projects, the other side of the tracks, the convalescent home on the other side of the tracks. It was the place where the sick people would go. It's the place where the sick people would stay because the main society didn't want to be inconvenienced with people who were sick, didn't want to be inconvenienced with people that were in need. If you weren't a functioning member of society, the Jewish society as a whole would look down on you and would shun you. So Bethany was the place where they would push their sick people. Bethany, you remember, you heard that name before. Bethany, who lived in Bethany? What big event happened in Bethany before? Jesus had some friends living there. Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus died. Jesus heard that Lazarus died and he stayed where he was for four more days. He comes to the grave where Lazarus was and says what? Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. That's the event that happened in Bethany. This is in Bethany, the same town where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. While they're in Bethany, a woman comes. Jesus is at a supper at a man's house. The man is named Simon the leper which means Simon was a leper, but now he's been healed. So Simon was known as Simon the leper. Jesus is at his house celebrating a meal. A servant girl comes in and anoints Jesus with some perfume. The price equivalent of this perfume is called spikenard. The price equivalent of this perfume would be thousands of American dollars. Per ounce. If you were to buy this amount of perfume for the same price back then, the equivalency of that price today would be paying about $1,000 an ounce for a bottle of perfume. Could you imagine that? This woman brings in enough perfume that she anoints his head, his body, and his feet with the perfume. She's showing a genuine act of love and worship to him, giving him all that she has. She's in Bethany, so she's a poor person. Somehow she got her hands on this, this expensive perfume, and she gives it all to Jesus to praise him. The disciples, led by Judas, began to complain about what she's doing. Have you ever felt like complaining about the way some people worship? Hmm. I know as charismatic Pentecostal, sometimes people get a little bit loud. Sometimes people seem to want to draw more attention to themselves than necessary. But is their praise genuine? If their praise is genuine, then let them be. If their praise isn't genuine, how do you know? We need to let people worship God the way they choose to worship. We need to let people and encourage people to worship Him with a genuine heart, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. This woman was truly worshiping him. How do we know? Because Judas began complaining about her. The other disciples chimed in and agreed with Judas. Judas said, why is she wasting this expensive perfume? If she didn't want it, she could have sold it and given the money to the poor. Now that sounds like a good idea, right? Why would you waste that? Why don't you take the money and give it to the church? Why don't you give that money to help the poor? There are homeless people in town. Help those homeless people. There are some unwed pregnancies. There are some people who are strung out on drugs and they need counseling. Why don't you give money to help those people? Why don't you help the people whose lights get turned off? Why don't you go help them instead of wasting the money on perfume? Help the poor who are sick. Help the people who need help. Help the people in the wheelchair. They sound like good excuses, right? And there's nothing wrong with helping those people. The Bible tells us that Judas asked this question not because he was concerned about the poor, but because 
He was the kleptomaniac who was stealing the money from the purse of ministry. He wanted that money that donated to the church so that he could get his hands on it and some of it be slipped into his pocket. The only reason he wanted that money was because he was stealing from Jesus. Mm. Could you imagine that? He's physically. Now we want to th talk about people sometimes and say, I can't believe she would do that in church. I can't believe he acted that way in church. But Judas was actually not just robbing from the church, he was actually robbing from Jesus personally. This wasn't something he did by accident or something he did by a misunderstanding. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He was taking money out of Jesus' wallet and putting it in his own pocket. Wow. He definitely was not committed to Jesus. Jesus confronts Judas and says, Don't harass this woman. Because what she is doing, she's doing out of genuine worship. And more than that, from this point forward, every time this gospel, every time this good news about the new kingdom is shared, her name will be honored. So because she honored Jesus with genuine praise, he's going to honor her forever. She is honored because she honored him. We need to have that kind of character, don't we? We ought to give Jesus genuine praise. We ought to give to him regardless of the expense we need to give to him. Regardless of the cost, we ought to give to him. We need to give him genuine praise, genuine worship. Give to him because everything we have has been given to us. Amen. Everything we have is a gift from him. Amen. So give back to him. Let's not associate with God based on what we can get. Sometimes people come to church. Now, I'm please don't call any names. But sometimes people come to church only to say, hey, you guys, you, do you help with the light bill? Hey, uh, my car is going to get repossessed. Can, you, can this church help me? Give me some money so my car don't get repossessed. Sometimes people are in genuine need. And we do help people in genuine need. So I'm not saying that's wrong. But if that's the only thing you see the church is, as a cash cow, then your relationship with Jesus is not real. Amen. Your relationship with him is evil. Because you're looking at him as a cash cow instead of looking to him as a savior. If what you need to do is commit to Jesus so that you desire a true worship with him. So that you desire to have a real relationship with him. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your benefit, you love on him because he is worthy. That's what we ought to do. But Judas is saying, why can't I have that money? Why do you waste that and give it to Jesus when I didn't even get an opportunity to get my hands on it. Sometimes people are like that. Have you ever heard of that person that starts coming to church just to get what they want and they pray and pray and when their prayers are answered, they leave. As soon as their prayers are answered, you never hear from them again. Because the only reason they were in the church is because they were He's in the very next chair. Yes, they reclined and not sat in chairs. I understand that. But in our concept, he's sitting in the next chair beside Jesus or sitting across the table from him for him to have access to the same bowl. He is close enough to physically touch Jesus. Imagine that. He is physically close enough to touch Jesus. He dips in the same bowl at the same time. He's saying that I'm intimate with you. Think about it. Who would you invite to a meal to celebrate? And of the people that you do invite to celebrate that meal, who do you dip into the same bowl with? Who would you trust enough to dip into the same bowl? You guys ever go to the Mexican restaurant? How many people dip into the same bowl as people you don't trust? That little bowl of red sauce? 
You take those free crackers and dip it in that red sauce. Enjoy that. But if the guy next to you, if you didn't trust him, would you dip into the same bowl with him? So Jesus, Judas, Judas is saying to Jesus, you can trust me. And he's dipping into the same bowl with Jesus. Jesus is saying, it's the one that dips in this bowl the same time I dip into this bowl. Then Judas asked, only then Judas asked, is it me? Mm -hmm. Only because he'd already been called. Then Jesus said to him, you have just admitted it. John tells us at that moment, Satan entered his heart. So he wasn't possessed yet. He had already got the 30 pieces of silver in his pocket before Satan entered him. If we pursue Jesus and we have a relationship that's not truly after his heart, we're setting ourselves up to be in league with the devil. Yeah, that's if we're not truly pursuing Jesus for true worship, we are setting ourselves up for the devil to take us over. That's right. We ought to be careful. Judas was putting himself in a position for the devil to use him to destroy Jesus. So God was still in control, but Judas wasn't right. So then Jesus tells Judas, go do what you're going to do and do it quickly. Mm -hmm. After that, Jesus gets his cup of wine. And we're going to receive communion in a few minutes. Jesus receives, he picks up his bread and his wine. And he says, this bread is a symbol of my body. And it has been broken for you. This wine is a symbol of my blood. The wine was supposed to remind the Jews and us too. And there were also Gentiles that were relieved during that Passover event. Everybody that was rescued by God, this wine is supposed to remind them of the blood that was shed when the death angel came. The wine shows redemption. The, the whole Passover event is a celebration of redemption. And that's what Jesus is saying. That we celebrate this. We celebrate this. We celebrate this because of what God has done. But today, we're starting something new. What does he start new? Look at verse 26. Matthew 26 began reading in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for me, for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it in you with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus breaks the bread, which is part of their normal celebration. Jesus is saying that every time you've done this in the past, for thousands of years, when the church would do this, it was a reminder and a prophecy. It was a reminder of what God did in the past, but it was a prophecy that I am coming. Amen. It is a prophecy about the new covenant, which is established in me, Jesus. He takes the wine. He says, remember the blood that was shed on the doorpost? Remember the blood that the death angel avoided? You remember and you celebrate that every year. When you drink the wine of Passover, you remember the blood shed from that lamb. And you know of the daily sacrifices where those animals are dead and their blood is shed. But all of that has been pointing to me because this is the new covenant. My blood is greater than any blood of any animal. The blood of that lamb, but my blood is shed 
for a new covenant. And in this new covenant, we celebrate him. We celebrate him because his blood cleanses of all sin of all time. Hebrews explains this event. And as Hebrews explains it, Hebrews says that those sacrifices were offered morning and night. He, Hebrews explains that those animals needed to be sacrificed one right after the other with there never being an end until Jesus came. For those sacrifices only reminded us that we're sinners. But the blood of Jesus actually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We have been set free from the bondage of sin. Amen. That's our new covenant. This is not a reminder that we're sinners. It's a reminder that He is God. Yes, amen. And He is our Redeemer. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we will receive communion. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now to praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you, Lord. Oh, God, your presence is strong. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. Lord, if there's anything in me that's wrong, forgive me. Yes. Forgive me. Lord, cleanse me. Search me and make sure there's no sin in me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Help me, Lord, that I can be pure in your sight. Yes. Help me that I will always pursue you because of who you are. I don't want a relationship just for what I can get. But Lord, I want that relationship that's genuinely pursuing your heart. Lord, I want to please you. Help me to be a man that pursues you. Cleanse me, Lord. Cleanse me. I would like to invite you to come forward to receive from me. Be careful opening this that you don't spill. If you hold open the top layer of plastic, you will expose a white wafer. This is a representation of the body of Jesus. Yes. To be clear, this is not physically his body. This is a testimony of his body. This we do as a remembrance, <coughs> as a celebration of what he has done, knowing that his body was broken. He willfully allowed his body to be broken by way of torture so that we can have fellowship with Father. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, is my body. Receive the body of Christ. Lord, your word we pray. Thank you, Lord. Praise, praise you, Lord. Peel back the aluminum foil carefully, and it will spill easily. This is not alcohol. <laughs> this is grape juice. Non-alcoholic grape juice. It symbolizes in remembrance of Jesus. It symbolizes his blood. Amen. It reminds us that his blood was shed for us. Drink from it. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for me for the remission of sin. So as you receive, remember Thank you, Jesus. your sins have been forgiven. The consequences of your sins have been removed because his blood yes. was shed for you. Receive the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank, Thank you, Lord.